Namo tasa begaveto araheto sama sambutasa namo tasa begaveto araheto sama sambutasa namo tasa begaveto araheto sama sambutasa So we're continuing on with the Mahaparinibbana Sutta the story of the Buddha's last days and he's continuing his journey through India stopping at various towns and monasteries and delivering discourses. This is his last period of teaching. And last time we saw the Buddha had the first serious attack of the illness, illness that will finally end his life, and he made a resolution to hold on to his life faculty on uh, for for uh, a while longer to continue his uh, his teaching. So we'll continue on now with the reading. Then the Lord, rising early dressed, took his robe and bowl and entered Vesali for alms. Having eaten on his return from the alms round, he said to the Venerable Ananda, Bring a mat, Ananda. We will go to the Chapala shrine for the siesta. Very good, Lord, said Ananda, getting him a mat he followed behind. Then the Lord came to the Chapala shrine and sat down on the prepared seat. Ananda saluted the Lord and sat down to one side, and the Lord said, Ananda, Vesali is delightful. The Udena shrine is delightful. The Gotamaka shrine is delightful. The Satambaka shrine is delightful. The Bahuputta shrine is delightful. The Chapala shrine is delightful. So the Buddha is seeing these places for the last time. So this is uh, his, his farewell tour of, of India. Ananda, whoever has developed the four roads to power, that is the Idipada, practiced them frequently, made them his vehicle, made them his base, established them, become familiar with them, and properly undertaking them, could undoubtedly live for a century or the remainder of one. The Tathagata has developed these powers, properly undertaken them, and he could, Ananda, undoubtedly live for a century or the remainder of one. So there's a little bit in this paragraph that needs to be explained. The four roads to power are the Idipada, and they are Chitta, which is, uh, Chitta means in general consciousness, but in this context it means having your mind focused on the task at hand. Your Chitta is full of the the, the task to be done. Uh, chanda is enthusiasm. Wiriya is um, energy. And uh, Vimanksa is investigation, the kind of a intelligent curiosity. These four qualities are the uh, sometimes called the basis of success. Whatever task is undertaken, whether it's a mundane task, you know, it's a, a, a job of work, or if it's a meditation development, like the uh, developing the jhanas, the idipadas will ensure success. And the Buddha here is saying that if one has developed them to the utmost, then he could, if he chooses, live for a century. Now, that's the, this translation, this is the Maurice Walsh translation, and he's translating it as a century, following the um, uh, the commentary. Uh, the Pali says that he could live for a kappa. And this has caused a lot of uh, discussion and controversy because a kappa generally means uh, the age of a world, like so from the beginning of uh, the, the planet to the end, so billions of years. Uh, so he, Buddha is saying he could live till the end of the world if he chose. That's the most literal reading of the text, but it was seen very early on as being a problematic idea. For one thing, if the Buddha lived for such a long time, it would undermine his teachings of impermanence. And for the second thing, it would be impossible because it's laid down as a law that there cannot be two Buddhas in the one world system at the same time, simultaneous. 
And uh, when Mateya Buddha comes, if, the, if Gautama Buddha is still alive, then there'll be two Buddhas on the earth. So kappa, more generally, just means a fixed length of time. It can mean the, the age of the world, but it, it can also mean uh, an, what's called an ayu kappa, which means a lifespan, a human lifespan, which is said to be a hundred years. So it was the um, tradition established in the commentaries that what the Buddha is saying here is that he could live, if he chose, to a full human lifespan, which is said to be a hundred years. So after the Buddha says, says that, Venerable Ananda, failing to grasp this broad hint, this clear sign, did not beg the Lord, Lord, may the blessed Lord stay for a century, may the welfare stay for a century for the benefit and happiness of a multitude, out of compassion for the world, for the benefit and happiness of devas and beings. So much was his mind possessed by Mara. And a second time and a third time, again, the Buddha makes the same statement and Ananda uh, fails to grasp the hint and ask him to remain. Uh, this became um, an issue later at the time of the First Council. Um, Ananda was criticized for this, for not uh, requesting that the Buddha remain. Now it says here that uh, so much was his mind possessed by Mara and the commentary explains that as Ananda was already a stream winner, Mara was unable to cause him to have any false view. But he was able to muddle his perceptions and induce hallucinations that cause confusion. So Mara muddled his mind and he missed the, the Buddha's clear statement and did not ask for the Buddha to remain. Then the Lord said, Ananda, go now and do what seems fitting to you. Very good, Lord, said Ananda. And rising from his seat, he saluted the Lord, passed by on his right, and sat down under a tree some distance away. Soon after Ananda had left, Mara, the evil one, came to the Lord, stood to one side and said, Lord, may the blessed one now attain final nibbana. May the welfare now attain final nibbana. Now is the time for the Blessed Lord's final Nibbana. Because the Blessed Lord has said this, Evil one, I will not take final Nibbana till I have monks and disciples who are accomplished, trained, skilled, learned, knowers of the Dhamma, trained in conformity with the Dhamma, correctly trained and walking in the path of the Dhamma, who will pass on what they have gained from their teacher, teach it, declare it, establish it, expound it, analyze it, make it clear till they shall be able by means of the Dhamma to refute false teachings that have arisen and teach the Dhamma of wondrous effects. And now, Lord, the Blessed Lord has such monks and disciples. May the Blessed Lord now attain final Nibbana. May the welfare now attain final Nibbana. Now is the time for the Blessed Lord's final Nibbana. And the Blessed Lord has said, I will not take final Nibbana till I have nuns and female disciples who were accomplished till I have lay followers, lay men followers, till I have lay women followers. May the blessed Lord now take final Nibbana. And the blessed Lord has said, Evil one, I will not take final Nibbana till this holy life has been successfully established and flourishes. It is widespread, it is well known far and wide, well proclaimed amongst mankind everywhere. And this has come to pass. May the blessed Lord now attain final Nibbana. May the welfare now attain final Nibbana. Now is the time for the Blessed Lord's final Nibbana. So Mara has been following the Buddha's career right from the beginning. Mara was always trying to disrupt the Buddha's uh, path. Um, even before his enlightenment, uh, Mara tried to prevent him from following the ascetic path. He said, if you choose, you could be a world-conquering monarch. And uh, the Bodhisattva refused to listen to Mara. And Mara tried to, to frighten him on the night of his enlightenment, and the Buddha was unmoved. 
And then he tried to prevent the Buddha from teaching. He tried to tempt him to just enjoy the bliss of Nibbana and so on. So the, the Mara has been making many attempts. Because Mara is a being, uh, he's a deity of a very high level in the Dewa realm. But he has kind of a self-appointed mission of trying to keep beings from escaping from the sense desire realm. He doesn't want anybody to get enlightened. And a Buddha is very dangerous to Mara's project. So he so he's been a dogging the Buddha's steps. And now he's trying to final his final attack. He's trying to tempt the Buddha. You know, you're finished, you've done your work, you're uh, you're old and tired, why don't you just pass into Nibbana? You know, why don't you just die and leave this earth? And the Buddha's reply the Lord said to Mara, You need not worry, evil one, that the Tagata's final passing will not be long delayed. Three months from now, that the Tagata will take his final Nibbana. So you, this is at the very end of the Buddha's life, his last encounter with Mara. And the tone of the conversation is kind of poignant. It's almost like these these adversaries have become sort of old friends. You know, they're kind of back and forth a little bit at the end there. The Buddha says, You need not worry, evil one, that the Tagata's final passing will not be long delayed. So the Lord at the Chapala Shrine, mindfully and in full awareness, renounced the life principle. And when this occurred, there was a great earthquake, terrible hair-raising, and accompanied by thunder, and when the Lord saw this, he uttered this verse, Gross or fine, things become the sage abjured. Calm composed, he burst, becoming shell. So, now we in the last section, we saw the Buddha held on to his life principle. Now he releases it, he renounces it. This is one of the, uh, the powers of a fully enlightened being, is that they have some control over the time of their death. He can mindfully and consciously renounce his life force and decide, oh, now's the time, it's finished. So now there's no turning back. It's the, it's the, the beginning of the end, so to speak. And he said there'll be three more months. And then the venerable Ananda thought, it is marvelous, it is wonderful how this great earthquake arises, this terrible earthquake, so dreadful and hair-raising, accompanied by thunder, whatever could have caused it. He went to the Lord, saluted him, sat down to one side, and asked him that question. Ananda, there are eight reasons, eight causes for the appearance of a great earthquake. The great earthquake, the great earth, is established on water, the water on wind, the wind on space. And when a mighty wind blows, this stirs up the water. Through the stirring up of the water, the earth quakes. This is the first reason. So he's the Buddha is here uh, expressing the ancient Indian theory of the, the structure of the earth, that the earth rested on water and the water on air. And when the air element becomes disturbed, disturbs the water, disturbs the earth, and then there's an earthquake. So the first reason of eight for an earthquake is a, a, a naturalistic one, even though the, the scientific details don't, ag don't agree with our own understanding now. It's still just based on natural forces. But the other seven are different. In the second place, there is an ascetic or Brahmin who has developed his psychic powers, or a mighty powerful Dewa, whose earth consciousness is weakly developed and his water consciousness is immeasurable, and he makes the earth shudder and shake and violently quake. This is the second reason. So the second reason is some being, human or dewa, using psychic powers causes an earthquake. Again, when a bodhisattva descends from the Tusita heaven, mindful and clearly aware, into his mother's womb, then the earth shudders and shakes and violently quakes. This is the third reason. This is a, uh, referring to uh, the first of a series of important events in the Buddha's life. And in each, each instance, there's an earthquake. It's marked by an earthquake and many other signs and wonders, like a great light. 
the uh, Buddhas, before they take their final human birth, they spend their last existence in Tusita Heaven, one of the Dewa realms. So Metya Buddha is currently there waiting for his turn. And when the Bodhisattva descends from Tusita, mindfully and fully aware, enters his mother's womb, that is at the moment of conception, and there's an earthquake. And when the Bodhisattva emerges from his mother's womb, mindful and clearly aware, then the earth shudders and shakes and violently quakes. This is the fourth reason. And when the Tathagata gains unsurpassed enlightenment, then the earth shudders and shakes and violently quakes. This is the fifth reason. And again, when the Tathagata sets in motion the wheel of the Dhamma, that, that is, uh, when he gives his first discourse and teaches the uh, Four Noble Truths, that's called the turning of the wheel, then the earth shudders and shakes and violently quakes. This is the sixth reason. And when the Tathagata, mindful and clearly aware, renounces the life principle, then the earth shudders and shakes and violently quakes. Again, when the Tathagata gains the Nibbana element without remainder, that is, when he passes away from this existence, uh, when he dies, although we don't generally use the term dying for a Buddha because uh, it's not the same as for an ordinary human. He doesn't continue on to a rebirth. He enters Nibbana. So it's generally just called entering the Nibbana element or Nibbana without remainder. The remainder is the body. So when the Buddha attains enlightenment, he enters Nibbana with remainder. He still has his body and, and still has some experience of his old karma while he's living in that body. But then there's no remainder after his death. Then the earth sh shudders and shakes and violently quakes. This is the eighth reason. These and then the, are the eight reasons, the eight causes for the appearance of a great earthquake. Now this, um, this section and there's a, uh, the next sections I'm going to read, various groups of eight these passages were very likely not original to this sutta because, for one thing, they don't all appear in the, the Chinese version, in the Agamas. It seems like the, uh, the Mahaparinibbana sutta was a favorite, you know, it was very well known and beloved sutta. One uh, obvious reason is that the, the story is very touching the last days of the Buddha. And many people in uh, olden times would would memorize this sutta, and it would be a well-known literature. And it, it seems that various other kind of doctrines and teachings were inserted that really were extraneous. This seems sort of out of context, but they're put in here. And this eight causes of earthquakes is the first one. Then... The uh, Buddha goes on with another list of eight. There are eight kinds of assemblies. What are they? They are the assembly of katyas. A katya is a um, warrior noble caste, the, the nobles. Sanskrit is kshatriya. The assembly of brahmins or priests. The assembly of householders. The assembly of ascetics. The assembly of devas of the realm of the four great kings. The assembly of the 33 gods, Tawatinksa gods, and the assembly of Maras, and the assembly of Brahmas. I remember well, Ananda, many hundreds of assemblies of Katyas that I have attended, and before I sat down with them, spoke to them, or joined in their conversation, I adopted their appearance and speech, whatever it might be, and I instructed, inspired, fired, and delighted them with a discourse on Dhamma. And as I spoke with them, they did not know me and wondered, who is it that speaks like this, a dewa or a man? And having thus instructed them, I disappeared. And still they did not know who has just disappeared. Was he a dewa or a man? And then the, the whole, uh, the whole uh, paragraph is repeated for the other types of assemblies. I remember well many hundreds of assemblies of brahmins, of householders, of ascetics, of dewas of the realm of the four great kings, of the thirty-three gods, of Maras, of Brahmas, etc., and they did not know. He who has just disappeared, was he Deva or man? 
Dizananda are the eight assemblies. So one of the attributes of the Buddha is teacher of gods and, and humans. And here he's saying that sometimes he would teach in these various classes of beings incognito. He would just show up in, in the appearance of one of these beings and, and teach him on Dhamma. Then the next section is uh, some highly technical details about uh, Kasina meditation. Kasina is a um, type of meditation that uses a visual object. You start with a artificially constructed object made out of wood or some other material painted in a, it made into a circle and painted in some bright color like blue, yellow, red. Uh, the four traditional ones are blue, red, yellow, and white. And you try to train yourself to be able to visualize that circle in your mind with your eyes closed, and then you don't need the physical form anymore. So he's talking here the eight stages of mastery. And uh, we can take all these, high, these are rather technical, but they all refer one way or another to casino meditation. Perceiving forms internally, one sees external forms, limited and beautiful or ugly, and in mastering these, one is aware that one knows and sees them. This is the first stage. Perceiving forms internally, one sees external forms, unlimited and beautiful or ugly. This is the second stage. Not perceiving forms internally, one sees external forms, limited and beautiful or ugly. That is the third stage. Not perceiving forms internally, one sees external forms, unlimited, beautiful, and ugly. And in mastering these, one is aware that one knows and sees them. This is the fourth stage. Not perceiving forms internally, one sees external forms that are blue, of blue color, of blue luster, just as a flax flower, which is blue, of blue color, of blue luster, or a Benares cloth, smoothed on both sides, that is blue. So one perceives external forms that are blue, and in mastering them, one is aware that one knows and sees them. This is the fifth stage. Not perceiving forms internally, one sees external forms that are yellow, just as a Kanikara flower, which is yellow, or a Benari's cloth that is yellow. So one perceives forms that are yellow. That is the sixth stage. Not perceiving forms internally, one sees external forms that are red, just as a hibiscus flower, which is red, or a Benari's cloth, which is red. So one perceives external forms that are red. This is the seventh stage. Not perceiving forms internally, one sees external forms that are white, of white color, of white luster. Just as the morning star Usadi is white, the morning star Usadi is the planet Venus, or a Benares cloth, smoothed on both sides that is white. So not perceiving forms internally, one sees external forms that are white. And in mastering these, one is aware that one knows and sees them. This is the eighth stage of mastery. These, Ananda, are the eight stages of mastery. Then another set of eight. There are, Ananda, these eight liberations. What are they? Possessing form, one sees form. That is the first. Not perceiving material forms in oneself, one sees them outside. This is the second. Thinking it is beautiful, one becomes intent on it. That is the third. So again, these, these first few, these first three stages represent the development of a casino meditation. And here he's talking, uh, the whole set is, he's talking about using casino as a vehicle for entering the formless abidings, that is the, the mind-only states that have no reference to body. The idea is that you develop a casino and then expand it infinitely and then remove it and be in your mind and be aware of infinite space. So that takes you into the formless abidings. By completely transcending the perception of matter, thinking space is infinite, one enters and abides in the sphere of infinite space. That is the fourth. By transcending the sphere of infinite space, thinking consciousness is infinite, one enters and abides in the sphere of infinite consciousness. That is the fifth. By transcending the sphere of infinite consciousness, thinking there is no thing, one enters and abides in the sphere of no thingness. That is the sixth. By transcending the sphere of no thingness, one reaches and abides in the sphere of neither perception nor non perception. This is the seventh. By transcending the sphere of neither perception nor non perception, 
one enters and abides in the cessation of perception and feeling. That is Naroda Sampati, which is uh, in uh, Vasudhi Maga, that's said to be only available to uh, someone who's uh, at least an anagami. This is the eighth liberation. So these four states, boundless space, boundless consciousness, nothingness, and neither perception or non-perception are, are uh, the arupa or formless jhanas. They're sometimes called the higher jhanas. There are additional, additionally refined states of mind after fourth jhana. So then the, the, that's the end of these lists. And then the story continues. Ananda, once I was staying at Uravala on the bank of the river Naranjara under the goat herd's banyan tree when I had just attained supreme enlightenment and Mara the evil one came to me and stood to one side and said may the blessed one now attain final nibbana may the welfare now attain final nibbana now is the time for the Lord's final nibbana and this I said to Mara evil one I will not take final nibbana until I have monks and disciples who are accomplished skilled learned knowers of the Dhamma. And the whole passage from previous section is repeated. Till I have nuns, lay men followers, lay women followers, who will teach the Dhamma of wondrous effect. I will not take final Nibbana until this holy life has been successfully established and flourishes, is widespread, well known far and wide, well proclaimed amongst mankind everywhere. And just now today, Ananda, at the chapel of shrine, Mara came to me, stood to one side and said, Lord, May the Blessed One now attain final Nibbana. Now is time for the Blessed Lord's final Nibbana. And I said, You need not worry, evil one. Three buds from now that the Tagata will take final Nibbana. So now today, Ananda, at the Chapala Shrine, that the Tagata has mindfully and in full awareness renounced the life principle. So now he's uh, uh, announcing that to, to Ananda. Ananda, of course, is his uh, attendant, has been his attendant for the last 20 years. At this, the Venerable Ananda said, Lord, may the Blessed Lord stay for a century. May the welfare stay for a century for the benefit and happiness of the multitude of com out of compassion for the world, for the benefit and happiness of Dewas and humans. Enough, Ananda, do not beg the Tathagata. It is not the right time for that. So now, too late, Ananda is asking the Buddha to remain. The second and the third time, the Venerable Ananda made the same request. Ananda, have you faith in the Tathagata's enlightenment? Yes, Lord. Then why do you bother the Tathagata with your request up to three times? But Lord, I have heard from the Lord's own lips. I have understood from the Lord's own lips. Whoever has developed the four roads to power could undoubtedly live for a century or the remainder of one. Have you faith, Ananda? Yes, Lord. Then, Ananda, yours is the fault. Yours is the failure that having been given such a broad hint, such a clear sign by the Tathagata, you did not understand and did not beg the Tathagata to stay for a century. If, Ananda, you had begged him, the Tathagata would have twice refused you, but the third time he would have consented. Therefore, Ananda, yours is the failure. You know? So, this asking the Tathagata three times is a is a motif that appears several times in the suttas. the The normal context is if someone asks a question to the Buddha that uh, the Buddha knows the answer will be painful to the person, that the Buddha will be silent, and then the, the but if the person asks up to three times, the Tathagata always answers. Uh, and in this uh, in this instance, he he says that he would have stayed for a hundred years if he'd been asked three times before he'd renounced the life principle. And then it turns out from this next next uh, paragraph, it it turns out that this was not the first time that Ananda missed the opportunity. Once Ananda, I was staying at Rajagaha at Vulture's Peak, and there I said, Ananda, Rajagaha is delightful. The Vulture's Peak is delightful. Whoever has developed the four roads to power could undoubtedly live for a century. And you, Ananda, in spite of such a broad hint, did not understand and did not beg the Tathagata to stay for a century. Once I was staying at Rajagaha in the Banyan Park, 
at the robber's cliff at the Satipatthani cave on the side of Mount Vedaba at the black rock on the slope of Mount Isigili on the slope of the snake's pool by the cool wood at the Tapoda Park at the squirrel's feeding ground in Waluvana in Jiwaka's mango grove and also at Rajagaha in the Madakuchi Deer Park. And in all these places, I said to you, Ananda, this place is delightful. Whoever has developed the four roads to power could undoubtedly live for a century. Once I was at Waisali at the Udana Shrine. Once I was at Waisali at the Gotamaka Shrine, at the Satambaka Shrine, at the Bahuputa Shrine, at the Sanananda Shrine. And now today at the Chapala Shrine, I said, these places are delightful, Ananda. Whoever has developed the four roads to power can undoubtedly live for a century or the remainder of one. The Tagata has developed these powers and he could, Ananda, undoubtedly live for a century or the remainder of one. But you, Ananda, failing to grasp this broad hint, this clear sign, did not beg the Tagata to stay for a century. If, Ananda, you had begged him, the Tagata would have twice refused you. But the third time he would have consented. Ananda, have I not told you before, all those things that are dear and pleasant to us must suffer change, separation, and alteration. So how could this be possible? Whatever is born becomes compounded. Whatever is born become compounded is liable to decay. That it should not decay is impossible. And that has been renounced, given up, rejected, and abandoned, forsaken. The Tagata has renounced the life principle. The Tagata has said once and for all that the Tagata's final passing will not be long delayed. Three months from now, the Tagata will take final Nibbana. That the Tagata should withdraw such a declaration in order to live on is not possible. Now come, Ananda, we will go to the gabled hall in the great forest. Very good, Lord. And the Lord went with the Venerable Ananda to the gabled hall in the great forest. When he got there, he said, Ananda, go and gather together all the monks living in the vicinity of Vesali and get them to come to the assembly hall. Very good, Lord, said Ananda, and he did so. He then returned to the Lord, saluted him, stood to one side and said, Lord, the order of monks is gathered together. Now is the time for the Lord to do as he wishes. Then the Lord entered the assembly hall and sat down on their prepared seat. Then he said to the monks, Monks, for the reason those matters which I have discovered and proclaimed should be thoroughly learnt by you, practiced, developed, and cultivated, so that this holy life may endure for a long time, that it may be for the benefit and happiness of the multitude, out of compassion for the world and for the benefit and happiness of devas and humans. And what are those matters? They are these the four foundations of mindfulness, the four right efforts, the four roads to power, the five spiritual faculties, five mental powers, the seven factors of enlightenment, and the noble eightfold path. So what the Buddha is saying here is that he's, uh, he's um, proclaiming to the monks that they should learn thoroughly in these various topics so that the Dhamma will pass on into future generations. And this is sort of a list of lists you know, um, that is sometimes it's called the uh, Bodhiyapaka Dhammas and it's considered to be like the essential core of the teaching. If the, And here the Buddha is telling the monks, make sure you learn these things and understand them and practice them and teach them. The four foundations of mindfulness the four right efforts, the four roads to power, five spiritual faculties, the five mental powers, the seven factors of enlightenment and the noble eightfold path. Then the Lord said to the monks, and now monks I declare to you, all conditioned things are of a nature to decay, strive on untiringly, that the Tagata's final passing will not be long delayed, three months from now that the Tagata will take his final Nibbana. So now he's made that statement in the assembly of monks. He's made it public. Then the Lord spoke. The welfarer having thus spoken, the teacher said this, Ripe 
I am in years, my lifespan determined. Now I go from you, having made myself my refuge. Monks, be untiring, mindful, disciplined, guarding your mind with well-collected thought. He who tireless keeps to law and discipline, leaving birth behind will put an end to woe.